Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special guest with us. It's Tiffany Wright, and she's the founder of The Resourceful CEO and author of The Founding Is Out There. Access your, ca your the cash you need to impact your business and solving the capital equation, financial situations for small businesses. Her mission is to help entrepreneurs increase their net worth, to attain financial th freedom and empower others to do the same. So thank you so much, Tiffany, for coming on the show. Why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Thank you, Stacy, for having me. I work as the, uh, the resourceful CEO. And what I do is... I either serve as a fractional COO or CEO, I mean, CFO, and occasionally a CEO. And in, and I step into businesses and help them rectify. First, I help them identify the issues that they have. Then I help them rectify those issues. And I, let's see, I started as an engineer at Honda. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that really laid the foundation for my operational understanding. And then I went to business school worked in corporate America, and I've been working with small businesses for the last, whoa, about 15 years right. in various capacities, like interim CFO, interim COO, and then restructuring consultant, and now fractional. <laughs> Same <laughs> kinds of things, but different, uh, different lengths of time and different uh, level of engagement. <laughs> <laughs> So basically what you do is you basically can help people, you know, get to the uh, people, entrepreneurs and businesses obtain the business that they desire, that if things aren't going as well as they want to, or if they're having problems, you know, trying to move upward, you kind of, you know, look at their business analyze it, see where the problems are, and then show them either how to scale their business or other options they can take to actually stay with their same goal and move forward up the mountain. Yes, that that's correct. And I like to say that you know everyone has different goals and you don't compare yourself to others. Don't say, oh, that company grew to 10 million. I need to grow to 10 million. Is that what you want? What does that mean to you? Is it just you're comparing yourself to someone or is it that growing your company to 10 million is going to provide you with a lot of what um financial stability i know a bunch of 10 million dollar companies were that are not financially stable <laughs> so anyways what i'm saying is focus on what it is you want so like when i went in as an interim sometimes uh, I typically i was only there for hmm, anywhere from three to nine months. I think the longest I was somewhere was a year and a half. And right around the time I would start to get bored, would be around the time the contract would be ending. And that's because the owners wanted to fix a certain issue mm -hmm. or issues. And then once those were fixed, they were they were fine. They wanted to be at you know three and a half million and they were at two and a half million. Right. They did not want to grow to five. So I'm chomping at the bits, identifying all this, all of these ways they could get to five, but that's not what they wanted because right. of what it would do to their lifestyle, amount of work and so on. So you have to focus on what it is you want. And I help business owners understand what it is they want, because lots of times people don't ask themselves, what do they really want? They focus right. on what they don't want instead of what they want. Oh, really? So, you know, I, I find that, you know, that, that I think that's one of the biggest problem for um, business owners and entrepreneurs is that they do compare themselves. You know, I think it's a natural human instinct. We tend to compare ourselves against people who have the same interests, but are on different levels. And sometimes it's impossible to get to the other person's level when they're on level 100 and we're on level two. You know, I think, you know, you have to also realize when they're making 10 million or $5 million a year, how much are they put in, in advertising? You know, they're yeah. spending millions and millions of dollars in advertising. How big is their team? You know, some people with small businesses have two to, you know, five people working for them, you know, right. and you, you are on a limited budget. So it's impossible to get to that person's level, even though it would be wonderful. Now, who says you can't? 
I say never say can't because you always can, but don't compare yourself to that high of a level. Make right. goals, I think, to, you know, and slowly try to work your way up. But like you said, think of what you really want. What do you as a business owner, an entrepreneur really want for yourselves? What would make you happy? I think that's important for people to look at is what would actually make them happy, close out the rest of the world and visualize on what your aspirations and needs are. Yes. And I think that's, I mean, just as human beings, that's an issue that we have. Most of us are so focused on what we don't want. We don't take the time to really think about what it is we do want, what mm -hmm. our personal goals are, what our family goals are, and business goals, all of this. And so we get we get stuck on a treadmill. Yeah. And it's the same for business owners, entrepreneurs, and it doesn't bring happiness. I mean, right. you're buying the latest car because somebody, you know, you have to get a Maserati because your neighbor got a uh, Lamborghini. And I don't know, but um, why? Right. Does that bring you joy? Now, if you got the Lamborghini because you just thought, man, I could race around, you know, I could rent the track, whatever. <laughs> and then you just experience joy. That's a completely different experience than buying one to one up this person who, you know, so yes. it's the same thing with, with, with your business. And so what I, I do with owners and what I recommend that all owners do is think about what it is that you want personally. What do you want five, 10 years from now? If you intend to keep your business until you retire, Mm -hmm. What do you want when you retire? Or what does right. that look like? And then think about your business and how it can provide you, um, how it can help you achieve those goals. And I do it in that order. Right. And I think that's great. You know what? I have just recently been to a seminar and I was reading another book. Um, um, this gentleman, he is, he, he helps people just like you scale their businesses, get to their desired goals. And I, one of the biggest thing he stresses is that people underestimate their abilities. Like they have done and accomplished so much yet they underprice their services and they underprice, um, the things that they offer to consumers and clients, you know, for a person who has services, for example, or even products, you know, let's take services first. They, you know, it takes them X amount of hours to complete a project or complete whatever they're doing for this client. But yet, you know, they look at, if you look at their past and how much they've accomplished and what the experience level that they have, then they charge the, the client because they're afraid they're going to lose them under, you know, too low a price, you know, mm -hmm they are underpricing themselves and they have to work 10 times harder when, you know, if the, if, because it, it, one of the statements that he said that is, especially in the United States, people want to pay more because people think it's better value, better quality when you charge more, but when you undercharge, you know, people are look, looking at, oh, this is probably not going to be good quality. And the people right. that you end up getting as clients are the people are on the lower end that aren't the clients that you want more so you know clients from other countries that are just trying to you know get the best money they can you know or lower quality you know clients that you really don't want to be associated you know you want to be on a higher level with better clients that you could say hey i service you know exxon i service this brand i did it for this brand you know and I think that's a big problem too, is people don't really value their self-worth and they don't price themselves the way they should. Is that something that you see? Yes, definitely. I always tell people like, like now we're in a recession. Yes. Uh, and like, oh, recession, recession, like the world is falling. And um, I mean, my own mother <laughs> was actually surprised to see so many people in the grocery store with all the high prices. She's been saying, yeah. this, this recession, it's just going to, you know, I said, you've got to stop watching the news. But yeah, there are all these people. <laughs> there are all these people. I thought, she thought the stores would be empty. Yeah, yeah. I stopped watching the news. It was depressing. <laughs> right. It's depressing. So, um, <laughs> but, but 
it's the same thing with business owners. They, if they, they tend to price low because they, they think that customers are, and clients are much more concerned about price than they are. And if you, for instance, if you are an, a, a, um, a small business attorney, let's just use that for an example, as an example, uh, because I use small business attorney. Right, right, right. <laughs> I won't, I won't reveal her name, but, uh, <laughs> but, but if you charge $150 versus charging $400 an hour, then the, the perception is that either you're just getting started or you're not that good. Yeah. So someone who can afford $400 will go after you and someone who can afford only one, who can barely afford 150, will go after the 150 person. But they, you will have to chase after them for the money and just all kinds of things. Right. And if someone can't afford the 400, but they think you're worth it, then they'll wait until they can. Yes. And that's the thing. And what I tell owners, and what I always say is, you just have to communicate the value. So many times, well, my owners know the value. No, I mean my my customers know the value. No, you don't. Because right. when I poll them, <laughs> um, they, I mean, they might know the value to them, yes. but they'll say, they'll say, well, there's nowhere in their marketing or anything that they say anything like that. I just know because I've been doing business with them. Right. So you have to communicate that value. And if it's in embedded, you have to extract it and make it clear. For instance, if you say you offer a uh, you know 90 day guarantee on some service and your competitors only offer a 30 day well then you need to point that out right you can't just assume that everyone knows that because they don't yes uh, and different things like that and that's what i just tell people to focus on what your values are and make sure you pull them out and communicate that to your customers and clients and it may feel strange at first Right. Uh, asking for more money or demanding more money, but you'll get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's if you're worth it and you actually have the ability and you have the experience, do yes. you want to do you want to work at, and do two projects and make a week's worth of money? Or do you want to end up doing 20 projects right. and then making that money and you're going to work 100 times harder and That's your right. worth and you and you produce a higher quality, you know, and I think people have to realize that. That's right. And that's also what allows you to elevate yourself and not have to do so much of the actual nitty gritty work. And um, they, um, they probably they can, can also focus on other things, other right. important things too. Right, right, right. And so that's, uh, it's, so it's just critical. It's, 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 that's what I tell people is it's never just one thing. It's it's a series of things that that all connect together that help you achieve what it is you want to achieve. And yeah, it's funny how uh, it, it does. Uh, it, blah 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 blah. It <laughs> does evolve. <laughs> it does evolve around self worth. Yes. And your idea of what you're capable of and so on, especially if you, you, you when you're down in the trenches and you're always just looking at what your competitors are doing and so on, you often don't take the time to have this global view of your business, your position in the market. Right. How are you doing with your customers? Think of you. And some people are scared to talk to their customers. Talk to them. Yes. Talk to them and then, because then you can do something about it. If they say, oh, they suck at this, this, that, and the other, but you can say, okay, or the prior customers. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> They're prior customers. <laughs> oh, and then you can say, okay, thank you very much. And then once you correct that, those issues, you can come back and say, we've corrected those issues. We thank you so very much. Would you like to try us again. And now that's right. when you can offer a discount or something like that. But when you offer a discount, mm -hmm. same thing, make sure you clearly communicate the discount. Right. Don't just say, I'm offering you a discount and then show the discounted number. 
show the amount with the discount because again, you need to communicate value at all times. So I think it's also probably good not just to verbalize, but also put it on paper and give a clear explanation. I think people don't realize, but if they put it on paper and they organize it so people could actually read it and visualize it at the same time and yes. realize that, okay, they're charging this, but they're giving me X, Y, and Z and, you know, and they guarantee me X, Y, and Z, you know, and you know, I think just like an info commercial and we'll include, you know, being <laughs> also a good way to advertise and maybe give a push so you could actually scale yeah. and, and make more and help your business grow. Yes, I I believe in marketing and I think a lot of businesses cut marketing as soon as there's any sign of trouble, which I think is wrong, but if they're not spending their marketing dollars wisely, then that's obviously the correct thing to do until they figure out right. what is working. But I totally believe that you need to communicate the value in your marketing messaging. Yes. What is it? So once you determine what the what the what your values are and so on, and how you stand up from the from the competition, then get someone who's really good at marketing or advertising yeah. to do it. If that's not your area of expertise. Don't do it. Just hand off to someone or work with someone who, who can help you do that. Now, have you ever found that many businesses don't really realize all the time who their audience is? And they they sometimes make the big mistake of not knowing exactly either what age group or is it male or is it female that they're marketing to? And they tend to market to the wrong group. And then they're wondering why people aren't interested in what they have to offer. And it's because they're not understanding who their audience actually is. Yes. Uh, the first thing I, I do when it comes to marketing is, and, and, you know, first I take a look at the messaging and so on. But then I, I ask, do they, do they ask where the people heard about them? Was it a referral? Right. Did they see their ad somewhere? Did they go directly to the website? How did they find them? Um, and <laughs> that's usually, that's usually a, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we don't ask. <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, so I do find that they don't, owners just don't know. They don't, I mean, there's some owners who, who do a great job of knowing who their customers are. Yeah, but there's others who do a very poor job of knowing who their customers are, and those are typically ones that are that have a lot more customers. Obviously, if you are a entity and you serve like seven big customers, you know who they are. Right, but they might not know who contributes as much. You know what the margins are for that customer versus other customers. Those kinds of things. So, should they really be going after those kinds of customers or not? Right, but. But they do know who their customers, but yet customers are. But yes, when they have like hundred or more customers, they often do not know. What do you suggest for those people? What should they start? Should they send out maybe a, a letter to them after they finish the project and say, "Oh, by the way, you know, you know, where did you hear from us?" Or do they do that in the beginning? You know, so they start understanding where people are finding them, so they can maybe advertise and promote themselves in the right areas? Well, I, I will typically say Google some of them and mm -hmm. see what kind of information you get on them that can, you can find information either on LinkedIn, although a lot of small businesses are not that active on LinkedIn, believe it or not, but I believe it. LinkedIn is great. <laughs> <laughs> LinkedIn is great. It is great. And so Google them or, or call them, call them up and, and that's the perfect time to do a customer survey and talk to your customer service specialists or the people who are actually providing the service delivery. Right. If you are providing a service delivery, then you know how big they are. You just have to scan your brain and, and document it. But if yeah. someone else is on your team, then you need to have them document what, what size company, how many employees and mm -hmm. so on, how 
how well they work with you, those kinds of things. Right. And, and that can provide you with a wealth of information in a very short period of time. So that's what I recommend to them. Okay. Now, I in the beginning, when we were talking, you had mentioned that you help businesses uh, really find out what they need. And then there are times when, you know, the business that they're in might not it might not be the right business and they might have to move on to something different. Now, when a person comes into your office and you first, the first thing you do is help them realize what they really want for themselves. You know, what are their goals? Then what, what do you do next with that client? What are their goals? And then what are the goals for the business? And then I need to see the financials because the financials tell a story. Right. And, and as a finance as someone who has a strong finance background, but also a strong operational background, I can ask, I can see a bunch of numbers and know what kinds of questions to ask and begin mm -hmm. to put the puzzle together. Right. And figure out what the heck is going on. And I ask questions. I always ask a bunch of questions. And sometimes it's of their of their employees. Sometimes I have to call customers. Sometimes I've had to call suppliers. It right. just depends. And, but that's, that's what I do so that I can get an understanding because it's one thing, it's good to know what the goals are. I need to see how close <laughs> <laughs> or how far away they yeah. are from achieving their goals. Right. And so that also helps if, if you're getting a little tired of the business, maybe it's just because you're burnt out because you're doing too much, but it could right. be that it's time to move on to something else and you've been wanting to but you've been feeling like I just, this business, I don't, you know, I, if I, if only I do a little bit more with this business, it will work. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. But, but that's why you look at the, you look at the goals first. Right. Because then that will help determine whether or not this business that once I see the numbers and the, op, how the operations are doing, whether or not the business is a good fit for you and your goals or isn't. Right. Right. Because I feel like a lot of people plateau in their business and they get burned out because they keep right. trying to figure out what is wrong. Why can't I grow? Why am I not getting to the place I want to get? And like you said, it could be an error that they're making or maybe it's time to to move on. But, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes if we have just little errors that we fix, things could just like start to burst like you know, I've known people that were making maybe $60,000 a year. They did the right thing. And then they made over a million dollars a year just right. by changing a few things. And a lot of people have told me that they, they actually made their niche a, a smaller niche because sometimes people have such a high and broad yes. niche that it's, it's, it's too many people and they can't focus on the main thing that's going to make them the most money. So sometimes just going and closing that niche into something small that could be very profitable that a lot of people want, that's not out there a lot, you know, and you don't have a lot of competition could actually benefit the, the person in that business. Yes. And I, I always tell people, you can't be all things to everyone. Right. That's a recipe for slow growth because yes. you're trying to serve way too many markets. Yes. And so if that's the case, if you're small, focus on identify one niche that you that you appear to be doing well in. Yes. That you are doing well in and not just right. appear <laughs> but that you <laughs> are doing well in and focus on that one. And if you've been around for a bit, maybe even two. And then get those streamlined and then you can add another one perhaps. But right. first focus on one or two and be very clear about who you're serving and why and all of that. And it, it I agree with you. It's 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 a huge difference between that and and you having your attention divided across all these different markets that, that frankly may not provide you with much money yeah <laughs> you may think it does but it right. doesn't <laughs> sometimes people think they're making money because the money is coming in but then when you look at the the monthly gross you're like wait I did this this and this how could I have only made this you know I see yes. that a lot with people yes there was there was a plumbing company that I worked with once and they they wanted to get rid of their residential component mm -hmm. they said, oh 
they're just horrible. The people complain all the time, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Right. And they said the commercial component was so nice. Mm -hmm. But when we examined the numbers and, and basically separated the commercial numbers from the residential numbers, we right. saw that the residential was five times more profitable wow. than the commercial. So even yeah. though they were a pain in the butt, <laughs> they were worth it. Yeah, because the company had more flexibility in charging trip fees because these were mainly after hour. Now during the day, mm -hmm. yes, one thing, but after hour trip fees and uh, emergency fees and you know just all these extra fees that they yes. add on, but they clearly communicate them in advance. Yeah, and, yeah, and so so you sometimes people make assumptions based on things that have nothing to do with actuality. It's like, oh, oh, these people get on my nerves. Right. So they must they must be horrible in terms of the bottom line. <laughs> 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 now sometimes that is the case. Yeah. There's yeah. One yeah. Client that takes up all your time. Yeah. And, and, and they're probably the one that pays the least. <laughs> right, right. And they pay the least, right. Right. <laughs> I find like, do you think when, when do people should, should they document it on the computer, start making lists and, and, or they, should they keep maybe like a little book on the side and have categories and write down things or, or check certain things each month to understand where the money's flowing, where it's, what's coming in, what's worth having, what's not worth having. I just spoke with a business person just the other day and they said that they were selling, you know, different programs and they realized that a lot of these programs weren't bringing a lot of money in and certain programs were doing really well. So they decided let's put our attention on the ones that are selling really well and then expand on those. And they cleared out all the other programs because it just wasn't br bringing in enough of money. And it was more to the person's eyes, you know, mm -hmm. so what they niched it down to the most popular ones you know, they felt that they probably can actually make more money. And because sometimes people see so many different options that right. they get overwhelmed. Yes. Yes. I, I agree with you. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not the birthday party organizer or anything like that. No. Yeah. And I remember my sister sent me to the store to get balloons and so on for her daughter's birthday, for my niece's birthday. Right. And I went into Target and I thought there would be like five choices. Yeah. And and there were like 30 <laughs> different combinations. And yeah. I said, oh, I'm overwhelmed. This, yeah. this is too much. This mm -hmm. is too much. So I had to call. But anyway, so yes, too many choices can lead to people just not making a purchase because they're overwhelmed and they don't know which one is best. The what I believe about people not, uh, what I believe that people need to look at on a monthly basis is their financial statements. But by that, mm -hmm. first of all, I mean monthly, monthly, and the books need to be closed by an accountant, not your bookkeeper. Okay. An accountant needs to review your books, do all this stuff with a general ledger. Right. You, please use Intuit or something similar, QuickBooks, Intuit yes. Quick, QuickBooks, or something similar. Depending on the size, if you're much smaller, you can use fresh books or something like that, much larger right. stage or whatever. But you get my point. Some yes. kind of automated software. And please don't have spreadsheets on the side. You don't need all of that. If you're mm -hmm. using the software correctly, it does all of that for you. Right. But you separate it out. And that's, I think, the biggest thing. It's just, and it, all it is, it's just a different code. So right. if it's different divisions or departments, mm -hmm. then you put that in there. You give each customer a code. And so then, and which most people do, but then they don't run a list of the customers and how much, you know, they don't run sales by customer. Right. They have the information in there, but they don't, they don't do that. And right. So they can't tell, or they don't run sales by product. Again, lots of times the information is in there, but they don't do it. And if you do that, then you can determine what works and what doesn't work. I mean, that's how right. we found the information out about the commercial, the plumbing company, commercial yeah. versus residential, but I also had a 
an outdoor entertainment company where we found that its original business, Fireworks, was just hemorrhaging them cash. <laughs> <laughs> hemorrhaging them cash. So, and, and the owner was having to put in all kinds of extra money, had to bring in an investor and so on. And so mm -hmm. we decided to get rid of that get rid of that now that wasn't an easy decision that took a period of time mm -hmm. analysis discussion with the different owners and so on but things like laser and what else uh laser and i'm missing something pyrotechnics mm -hmm. were significantly more significantly more um profitable right and generated more more cash flow so anyway so these so by doing this yes then you can you can have a lot of information. So, yes, financial statements once a month. Yes, because I think people lack that now. Do you, what do you suggest about business having when people get their emails and they know who their customers are? Is that something that they could use to help upscale their business or help maybe grow their business? Because a lot of people don't do newsletters. I know a lot of business people mm -hmm. and I ask them if they do their, a newsletter, they're like, no, we don't do a newsletter, you know, and they don't realize that maybe that could actually help promote sales or help them remind the person that they even exist because that, if they don't use them after a while, they might forget about them. Yes, I think, I think it's, for more for more consumer focused businesses i think it's i think a newsletter is probably less important than maybe like social media or something yeah but for b2b businesses for businesses focused on serving other businesses yes because it often i mean sometimes you enter into an ongoing contract right but lots of times it can be chunky I use yeah. you this time and then I use you again in six months and then I use you again. And so, but if you're not, at you're not top of mind or if someone else takes the role and then you, then you could be missing out on it. I mean, people need to know that you're still there. Right. And you don't have, have the bandwidth as a small company to, to call all these people, but you can do a quarterly newsletter. Right. Maybe monthly is too much, but quarterly would be just right for some kinds of businesses. And if if monthly is better for you, there's other entities out there that can help you. It doesn't have to be really complex. The main thing yeah. is to celebrate your wins, mm -hmm. announce new products and right. services, and and then maybe give some if you know a little bit about your a company. Maybe you know if this employee got employee of the month for their stellar customer service right. or something like that right yeah <laughs> they get a little bit more so it's it's less salesy and a little bit more like we're just updating you on here yeah yes so i i wholly agree with the newsletter and i wholly agree with you that too few businesses use them you know, I, I like how you say about personable. I think people really, you know, I had one one client that didn't think that um, being that you shouldn't have too much uh, personal information, but you know, statistically, people like to hear this the background story of where this business came from or this person's story. Let's say if they're they're in, you know, if they're a company, a small company, and they started, you know. Where did it begin? Why did they begin? What's their mission? You know, and be a little bit more personal. And sometimes just having that personable story that someone could relate to in some way can actually click the bond and actually build the trust, I think, between the customer or, you know, possible customer and the company. I totally, I totally agree. I think if you, I mean, think about yourself. Do you, do you respond better when, and I hate this, when I go to a net, <laughs> like a business, and I don't do these networking groups anymore, but yeah. if you go to a business function and someone just walks up to you and hands you their card and says their name, and then they move on, what the heck? I yeah. don't know who you are. I can right. read your card, but that's it. But if I had a little conversation with them and found out a little bit about them besides who their company is, Right. And I'd be much more likely to call and I'd write a little note. Yes. That's the thing. I, that's the way you, that's what personalizing a newsletter does. 
when you add a little bit of the human factor into your newsletter, it works like that. People remember you more. Oh, that's the company that just got this new GM who, who, I don't know, who came from this, whatever. Yes. Who came from Wisconsin. So forgive his, his, uh, his accent. <laughs> I, I'm in Georgia. I'm in Georgia. Obviously, I don't. I'm not originally from Georgia, but yeah. <laughs> but things like that. <laughs> right, right. I, you know, if if you had to give like some tips to people who are small business owners or entrepreneurs and they're not where they want to be, you know, mm-hmm. what are some of the things that you could give some advice to kind of get them, you know on the right track. So maybe they can start to grow. You know, do you have any advice for these people that you think would be helpful? Yes. For one, there's a, there's a, <laughs> advertise another, but there's a, 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 they need to read books or, or listen to podcasts or about businesses that have seceded but that tell the whole story right. that maybe they failed, maybe they went through bankruptcy, maybe mm-hmm. they had to live in their parents' basement. Uh, basement for five years. Maybe they had, you know, all these different things that you don't hear in the business press. People right. need to understand that these things don't just happen overnight. Like they do. In the, oh, look, they, yeah. raised, they raised 40 million and now they're off to, well, they've been in business for eight years and they finally managed to raise 40 million after they reached 200 million in revenue and just could not generate enough cash flow to grow. So, (laughs) and the one was sleeping and I know that I I listened to one story and the one was saying she couldn't even buy maternity clothes and she had to live with her parents for five years. She and her husband, Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) even though her husband was working, but all of his money was flowing into her business. Mm. Um, so she ultimately sold her business for a little bit over a hundred million, but all of this stuff, the business press totally goes, totally ignores that. Right. And I think it's very, very, very important for people to understand because what people say to themselves is they did it. Why can't I? Right. Yes. So they need to understand the what really happens when scaling a business in yes. that sometimes it takes a couple de- decades to yes. scale a business to a certain size. It's not just these that, you know, out the gate, you know, hit. So I think that's, that's really important to set the expectations. Yes. And then, like I said, the goals, what are your goals? What are your goals for your business? Right. That's very, very important. And then go get, go get help. Yes. Reach out, join either business groups that can help you or let's see, the SBDC is free. The mm-hmm. small business development centers are free through the SBA. They're often at colleges and so on and other like women business centers and so on. But those kinds of places are typically free, at least for a couple of uh, consultations, their score, service core, yes. retired executives. So that's what I would say is first steps. If you are tentative and you're not sure what you want to do and you're trying to work through some things, I'm not saying that you'll be able to answer all of this with just working with yourself, right. but it is, it, it is a great way to get started. That's great advice. Now you are an author, two books, correct? Yes. Can you tell me about them? Yes, the funding is out there. Access the cash you need to impact your business and solving the capital equation, financing solutions for small businesses. Well, the first one I wrote out of just pure, what do you call it? Frustration. Mm -hmm. I was telling the same story to people over and over again. They'd say, I, I, it, it's so hard to find funding. It's so hard to get a bank loan. It's so hard, hard, hard. I, I don't like when people say I can't. So typically if they said I can't, I would, right. because, um, I remember this guy said I can't and it turns out he only went to two banks and they were two of the largest, two of the large 
national banks, right. and, which was not a good fit. And <laughs> he just could not hear me. Yeah. So I decided when people say I can't, they've already decided. Yeah. And if they say they can't, they can't. Mm -hmm. So what I tell people is to say it's difficult. And so what I did was I helped people get financing. And sometimes it would, it would, we do it all in one, one bit. Right. Other times it would take two or three different entities, depending on what they wanted. Right. And so, but yes, that was the, that was the genesis of the first book. So two people told me, write it down. Yeah. So whenever something, whenever I help someone get funding, I would write down all the information about the, obviously I changed the names, but right. I'd write the, the industry, the company, how long it took, how much money, that kind of thing. Right. And so then I just put it all together. And then the second one I did some years later, because I realized that while I focused a lot on the funding, I didn't talk about cash flow enough. Right. And I really think companies need to understand the, how cash flow, how cash flow is, is comprised of three different components and three different components that I think I was holding up for three different components and when they an operational, if you can get your operational cash flow higher, then you need less financing cash flow. Right. And so but I really talk about that a lot and how it impacts some of the different kinds of funding that's yeah. out there. Like if you're a construction company bonding, you right. need to have a certain amount of cash flow available. Anyways, so and I also added more of the like non-traditional, like peer-to-peer -peer yeah. or, um, and, and things like that. And, and, uh, and then of course the examples of the people that I helped right. and why I thought it was important and so on. Now, where can people, first of all, before we go into another subject, where first, where can people find these books? They can find, uh, because the first one's a little older, it's, it can be found on Amazon, mm -hmm. um, but the second one, the most recent one, can be found on Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, Walmart.com, mm -hmm. and so on. Great. Now, where um, your website? Can you tell everybody your website so they know where to go, and so they can get more help from you and learn more about you? The ResourcefulCEO.com forward slash scheduling. If you so you can get a free twenty minute consult. I'll have you fill out a form so we can make the most of that 20 minute time because right. you may not need me. You may not need me. I'm not going to just say, Hey, here's a, here's a quote for you. But, right. but I want to make sure that you get a lot out of that 20 minutes. So, and also I need you to be focused because mm -hmm. without filling out that form, people go all over the place. Right. And um, so it didn't, Typically, people tell me it typically takes them a day or two <laughs> <laughs> just because it requires them to think yes yeah it requires them to think and uh, so yes so that's it the resourceful ceo.com that's great you know it's been a pleasure having you on this show and i've learned a lot just by talking to you and the, the advice you gave was absolutely phenomenal i think it will help many you know small business owners and entrepreneurs because it's tough out there for business owners and and small entrepreneurs and i think you know they get frustrated very quickly because they want things to happen fast and like you said it takes time and making the right choices and taking the right steps you know little by little but making sure you don't try to jump from A to Z. And most important, don't compare yourself to those big industries and corporations out there that are doing the same thing. And, you know, their funding is a lot more than, you know, what yours is. So it's just being your own person. And like you said, creating what's good for you and then going after that goal and not someone else's goal. Thank you so much for having me, Stacey. I really enjoyed myself. Oh, I enjoyed myself too. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for coming on this show. I appreciate you coming and, you know, we'd love to have you back one time. <laughs> okay. You have a great day. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.